Thanks so much for joining me for another edition of Parker Biology. This is part two of regulation of eukaryotic gene expression. In part one, we examined several key places where eukaryotes can regulate gene expression, including the packaging of their DNA, histone modifications. We looked at transcriptional regulation, regulation of RNA processing, specifically alternative splicing, and we looked at the fact that if RNA gets to stay around for a long time, more of the protein will be made. Here we're going to pick up over in the translation realm of things. Translation is another great opportunity to regulate gene expression, and this regulation usually occurs at the initiation stage of translation. In some cases, initiation can be blocked by regulatory proteins that bind to certain sequences, often within the untranslated regions at the 5' prime or 3' prime end, and this can prevent attachment of ribosomes, which would clearly prevent translation. Sometimes this regulation is of selected messenger RNAs, but there can also be more global control of all mRNAs within a cell. This global control usually involves activation or inactivation of one or more of the protein factors that's needed to initiate translation. A great example of this global control occurs in fertilized eggs. Just after fertilization, translation is triggered by sudden activation of translation initiation factors and the response is a burst of synthesis of proteins encoded by the stored mRNAs. There are also regulation opportunities following translation. For example, various types of processing can occur. Sometimes portions of a polypeptide chain are cleaved, sometimes different chemical groups can be added, and sometimes the polypeptide chain can be phosphorylated and all of these things can change the activity levels of these proteins. Additionally, some proteins need to be transported to target destinations in the cell in order to function properly. Regulation can occur at any of these steps involved in modifying or transporting the protein. Once a protein has been processed and transported and it's fully functional, the length of time that the protein functions in the cell is also strictly regulated. And this is regulated by means of selective degradation. So if a protein gets to stay around longer, it's going to carry out its functions for a longer period of time. When a protein is meant to be degraded, when it should be broken down, when it's no longer needed in the cell, it's marked by a substance called ubiquitin. And ubiquitin is going to allow large proteasomes to recognize these proteins and help degrade them. Here we see multiple ubiquitin molecules attached to a protein. And this ubiquitin tagged protein is recognized by the proteasome, which is shaped like a giant trash can. This proteasome is going to unfold the protein, sequester it within a central cavity, and then enzymatic components of the proteasome cut apart the protein into small peptides, which can be further degraded by other enzymes in the cytosol. In summary, eukaryotic cells can regulate whether or not translation takes place, if it does, how the proteins get modified and become active, and how long those proteins get to stay active for. Only a small fraction of our DNA actually codes for proteins. And some of this non-protein coding DNA does end up coding for rRNA and tRNA, remember which help with translation. But a lot of this non-coding portion of the genome actually ends up being transcribed into what we call non-coding RNAs or NC RNAs. What do these do? Why would they exist? Well, the role of non-coding RNAs is actually to regulate gene expression. And this occurs at two main points, mRNA translation and at chromatin configuration. We're going to focus on just two of these non-coding RNAs. We'll be examining microRNAs and small interfering RNAs. 
The importance of these RNAs was acknowledged when they were the focus of the 2006 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. MicroRNAs, like the name suggests, are small. These are single-stranded RNA mo molecules, and they can bind to messenger RNA. The role that they play is either in degradation of messenger RNA, or they can also block its translation. These microRNAs are made from longer RNA precursors that fold back on themselves, forming these hairpin regions. And we can see that the adjacent chains are going to be linked up via hydrogen bonds. So initially, we're going to see the hairpins get cut away from the precursor. So we'll cleave here, and we're going to follow this down the right-hand side of the diagram. Once the hairpin is cleaved, it's then going to be further trimmed by an enzyme called dicer. So dicer is going to trim this up into shorter segments. And notice now, one of those two strands is going to get degraded. The remaining strand is actually the microRNA, which will now form a complex with nearby proteins. This complex can now bind, because of the presence of this microRNA, it can now bind to other RNA. It can bind to any target that contains at least seven bases of complementary sequence. If the microRNA and the target mRNA are complementary across their entire length, then the mRNA gets degraded. If the match is a little bit less complete, then the microRNA functions simply by blocking translation. Scientists have found that injecting double-stranded RNA molecules into a cell somehow turns off the expression of a gene that has the same sequence of the RNA. And they call this phenomenon RNA interference, or RNAi. This RNA interference is brought about by small interfering RNAs, or SI RNAs. These are really similar in size and in function to the MI RNAs, those micro RNAs that we just looked at. The same cellular machinery actually generates these microRNAs and these small interfering RNAs, and they can both associate with the same proteins and have similar results. They simply come from slightly different precursors. So we mentioned that non-coding RNA can impact translation of these mRNAs, but we also hinted at the fact that they could impact chromatin structure. In some yeast, these small interfering RNAs can actually play a role in heterochromatin formation. Remember that highly condensed form that would block regions of the chromosome from gene expression. There are also some other non-coding RNAs called peewee-associated RNAs, and these also cause the chromatin to highly coil, which is going to block expression of portions of their genome. The final idea we'll look at today is how gene expression during embryonic development can lead to such high specialization within an organism. We know that cells are organized into tissues, which are organized into organs, which are organized into organ systems. So in order for the entire organism to form properly, we know that development must produce cells of different types that form higher level structures arranged in a particular way in three dimensions. It's pretty amazing to think that a fertilized egg or zygote can result in a complex multicellular adult organism. There are three parts of this transformation. The main processes involved are cell division, cell differentiation, and morphogenesis. It takes just four days for cell division, differentiation, and morphogenesis to transform each of the fertilized frog eggs shown here into a tadpole like the one shown here. The cell division part of this process was covered back with the cell cycle. We know that round after round of mitosis is required simply to make more cells for this organism to become multicellular. 
But embryonic development isn't just about increasing the number of cells, but also about cell differentiation. This is where cells become specialized both in structure and in function. These different kinds of specialized cells can't just be randomly distributed, but they must be organized into tissues and organs in a specific three-dimensional arrangement. The physical processes that give an organism its shape constitute morphogenesis, meaning creation of form. All of these different types of cell structures and functions are due to different genes being read. This differential gene expression results from genes being read differently in each type of cell. But if all of our cells came from one cell, that zygote, how did different cells decide which different portions of their genome to read? Well, it turns out that materials in the egg can actually set up differential regulation that's going to be carried out as the cells divide. What generates the first differences among cells in an early embryo? And what controls the differentiation of all the various cell types as development proceeds? By this point, you can probably guess the answer, the specific genes expressed in any particular cell of a developing organism determines its path. There are two key sources of information used to tell a cell which genes to express. These include information or substances in the cytoplasm, along with substances surrounding the cells. Cytoplasmic determinants are the substances within the cell. These are in the cytoplasm, and these are not uniformly distributed. So as the zygote undergoes subsequent rounds of mitosis, each of the regions might have different cytoplasmic determinants which could lead to different gene expression. Here we can see how this uneven distribution of cytoplasmic determinants can lead to one cell having a very different set of substances than its neighbor. Substances surrounding the cell can also have profound impact on gene regulation. In the process called induction, Signal molecules from embryonic cells can cause transcriptional changes in nearby cells. Interactions between these neighboring cells can have effects on differentiation. Scientists coined the term determination to refer to the events that lead to observable differentiation. Once the cell has undergone determination, it's irreversibly committed to its final fate. Even if it's put in another place in the embryo, it will still become the type of cell that it was fated to become. Not only is it vital that cells have their specialized structures and functions, they also have to be properly arranged three-dimensionally. Pattern formation is the development of spatial organization of tissues and organs. And this is going to start with establishment of the major axes, differentiating between the right and left side of the body and the anterior and posterior ends. The molecular cues responsible for controlling pattern formation are called positional information. And this tells the cell where it is relative to these axes and the neighboring cells. This positional information is provided by both cytoplasmic determinants and inductive signals. A lot of our key discoveries with regard to early development were made by studying the fruit fly or Drosophila. These discoveries include homeotic genes, which control pattern formation in the late embryo, larval, and adult stages. We'll talk more about Drosophila in class. Hopefully through parts 1 and 2 of eukaryotic gene regulation, you have a better understanding that regulation can occur at the DNA level, through transcriptional control, through regulation of RNA processing, through RNA degradation, as well as in translational control, protein processing, and degradation. We've also looked at the role that non-coding RNA can have, along with examining how expression can lead to different types of cells, especially in early embryonic development. Thanks so much for joining me for Parker Biology.